Well, we get to the point where just in a catch up that uh, catch up with what's going on here is that you know that Jacob and Esau were battling rivals and that God had promised to bless Jacob, the younger over the older. And as we read in Romans, that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Certainly we begin to see Jacob, but that wasn't enough for Jacob, even though the promise was to him. He was still seeking to deceive. When he deceived his brother out of his birthright, and then he deceives his father Jacob in his blindness, and his mother Rebecca helped him to deceive and get the covenant blessing, which he did not need to go that route. God had already given it to him. How many times God has already blessed us, but we feel like we need to manipulate the circumstance to our better outcome and our better way because I'm afraid it could go the wrong way and God would actually not fulfill his word. How many circumstances we find our minds in doing and trying to manipulate life in this way. But nonetheless, when he had deceived his father with the goat hair and with the smell of Esau's clothes because Esau was out hunting, stole the blessing, and then Esau comes in and weeps and wails because he realizes the blessing has already been given away to Jacob, which was God's will, and how God even works through the evil circumstances, and God's will will not be thwarted in any way by the world, by the flesh, or by the devil, and I'll keep bringing that up. It's not going to be thwarted in any way. Nonetheless, Esau says, as soon as our father dies, Isaac, because they thought Isaac, was, Isaac even thought he was dying. But Isaac, when he's laying there, he would go on to live for some time more. But even the family and Esau thought, my father's dying. But when my father dies, I'm going to hunt my brother down and I will kill him. Anger, full of rage and anger. This causes, to Rebecca, causes Rebecca to send her son Jacob away to Uncle Laban's, her brother, way up north, out of the promised land once again. Way up north, Padan Aram, all the way to the top and out of the promised land. The reason she sent him, because she knew that Esau was going to kill Jacob. Plus, Esau had married two Canaanite wives and they were not of the faith and they were a thorn in her side and Isaac's side. And she says, I will not allow Jacob to marry outside the camp here among these Canaanites. But let me send him to another pagan, Laban, which you'll see. And so there he would find a wife, which was, we see, was the Lord's will. Jacob knew that when he got there, or let me say he didn't know that when he got there, he was meeting his match in deception. He was meeting his match in a liar, in the form of Laban. Laban is a godless man. The more I read through this and the more that I saw what Laban was doing, it made me angry because have you ever been deceived by a telemarketer? Have you ever had money taken from you that you thought was a good deal and come to find out you got scammed? If you haven't got scammed, God bless you, but I'm telling you, most of us in here have been scammed in one way or another. By a boss, by someone on the phone, by something uh, uh, on Amazon, by something This happened to my son John Michael years ago. He got caught up in a scam. He was trying to sell his iPad, and when he did... Somehow the person had, it was very, very, very crafty how they did it, but scammed him out of an iPad. Now, this is not a recent thing, but it still makes me mad. I, I just remember certain phone calls and certain things, and even my wife trying to call Walmart to settle a bill, and she forgot to put in, I think she put in one L instead of two. Well, if you press in one L, they're scammers that are there saying, and they're ready to scam you, get your, your card number, your social security number. She realized, thankfully, what was going on. But I think what angers me the most is that these people that are, quote unquote, we're in Africa, but we need money to release a large amount of money. Can you send $1,000? 
or some other kind of scam that has happened with various ways. And, and who do these people typically go for? They go for older folks that are in homes that have lots of retirement money, lots of savings, but they're not quite as mentally sharp as they used to be. That's where these people get their money. And when you begin to think of people like that, how do you live with yourself? How do you actually consciously live knowing that you took people's life savings and you're okay with that? It just begins to grind on you. Or when you know that your boss is taking advantage of you in every single way that he possibly can. He's going to manipulate things into his way or because he wants to look good in front of his boss by making you look bad and getting you to a point where you're frustrated. There's all these kind of scams and these lies and manipulations and you've been had. I know that you walk away and you can't help feel that um, you want revenge. But I will tell you, as the old proverb says, not in the Bible, but as the old ancient, I think it's a Chinese proverb, when you begin on the road of revenge, make sure to dig two graves. So it never works that way. But Jacob is coming into these circumstances. When Jacob arrives there and he meets Rachel, we won't go through the whole story, but he gets by the well and he's going to be a man's man. He gets a stone off the well because nobody else would and he waters her sheep and he's so glad to see her. This is the woman of his uh, dreams. This is a beautiful woman like he's never seen before. And then he goes to Laban and meets Laban and then the wedding begins to happen after seven years, he worked hard. He worked hard so that he could have Rachel only to after consummating the marriage, only to wake up the next day and saying, who is this? This is Leah. He, he fooled me. He manipulated the circumstance. He, he lied to me. He gave me Leah. And so when Leah, he realizes that he has already consummated the marriage and now he cannot just give her back. He realizes that he's been cheated, confronts Laban. And Laban said, okay, okay, okay. Just let the wedding week go by and then I'll give you Rachel. And so he lets the wedding week, but if I give you Rachel to marry at the end of this week, you have to work seven more years for me. He knew that Laban was in charge. He was a master manipulator. He was a liar from the devil himself. Kind of, Jacob had to say at some point, kind of reminds me of me. This is who it is. Be careful when you judge other people. Always do this. Hear me out. Make sure you judge yourself first. We always point to somebody else, but we never take stock in saying, ha, what they have done, I have done. It's in me to lie and manipulate. And so Laban does this and he finally gives Rachel and now he's been there 14 years and the whole time he's saying this. He remembers Genesis 28 and that God said, I will be with you and that I will make a whole nation out of you. From you shall come nations, just like Abraham. But this time it becomes realized. And as he's there for those 14 years, 11 boys are born. And one daughter. And later on, Benjamin would come later and Rachel would die after Benjamin. But there would be 12 boys. But at this point, there's 11 boys and one daughter. And he realizes that he needs to get home. Because God said, I will bring you back into the land. It's a long time to wait for the woman of your dreams, seven years, and to work hard. But it's even longer when you've been fooled and you have to work seven more years. Much patience has to go on before God's promise, seeing the fulfillment of it. But in the midst of that, there are all the children and there are all the circumstances that are going on. And as he finally gets to that point where he's ready to go, why? Because Rachel, who was barren, now has born a son. Now a son is born. 
And isn't it interesting? You would think that all the 12 tribes of Israel would come from Rachel. But God does what he does again. Where do they mostly come from? Leah, the one who was not supposed to be his wife. And there are times I've looked to the heavens and said, God, I am bewildered in how you do things. They are righteous, good, and true. And men, we have a way, and women, we have a way of just messing everything up all the time. And we often say to ourselves, how's God going to work through this mess? I mean, it's a mess. I don't know how many times I've stood back from life and just saying, Lord, oh, Lord, we are so sinful, and we just make a mess of everything. I don't know how you're going to work. And then he does. Because that's what we always say, and it will say to you again, your story is not over. And neither is your family's or the person beside you. Your story is not over. You will mess up. You will sin. You will make mistakes. You will fail. But we are faithful. But God is faithful. And that's what we depend on. That is what our trust is in. But it gets to a point where Rachel comes and she begins to have go into labor and have her son Joseph. That's it ends there in verse 22. And God remembered Rachel. And God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, which in the latter part, maybe in about five years we'll get to it, but in the latter part, there's Joseph. And Joseph is finally born. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son, in which we will see Benjamin eventually come. But as soon, as soon as Rachel had born Joseph, then it's time for Jacob to say, it's been 14 years, enough. I want to go home. And so through this, we see the circumstances of Jacob and Laban's agreement. The circumstances of Jacob and Laban's agreement, 25 through 30. And if you have your outlines with you, you'll see that number two, the conditions of Jacob and Laban's arrangement. There were certain conditions that Jacob put upon it, and you'll begin to see Laban and his craftiness but Jacob also has a crafty mind also, and he's going to start doing some tricks, and he's going to start um, back to his old ways again. And You see the cause of Jacob's abundance, because even though Laban tried to stop him, Jacob becomes incredibly wealthy, just like his grandfather Abraham, just like his father Isaac. There was no stopping it. Jacob, in every which way that Laban tried to, Jacob still has an abundance by the time he leaves. And so number one, what is the circumstance of Laban's, Jacob and Laban's agreement? First of all, you see that it's Jacob's desire. He wants to leave, verse 25 and 26. After Rachel bears Joseph and his, his own male child, he comes in verse 25. And he said, after Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own home and country. And this is an emphatic statement. This is a face to face. He's, you can understand, he's frustrated. But he says it in a commanding way, send me away that I may go home to my homeland, the place in which I have come from. Release me. Now, he could have just walked out, but why didn't he? Well, you'll notice in the next verse, he says, verse 26, Give me my wives and my children from whom I have served you, that I may go, for you know the service that I have given to you. Now, why would he put it this way? Because by law, by law, his daughters and even his Laban's grandkids belong to Laban. We may not agree with that law, but it doesn't really matter what we think today. It's what's happening in the text here. He knew that Laban would have to release his family 
from his indentured servanthood, which was technically over. But you know Laban, he's in charge. There's no 911 to call. There's no service people to come and saying, hey Laban, you can't kidnap these people. There's no kind of law like that around. Laban's in charge. He gets to manipulate the situation in any way that he wants to because he has many servants, he has sons, and he has people that are going to take his side and Jacob begins to realize, I'm outnumbered. There's nothing I could do about this situation. This man is in control, but I'm asking you, release me, release my wives, release my 11 kids, release me from all of this. But in verse 27, Laban said to him, if I have found favor in your sight, which is an oriental way of trying to butter up somebody. He didn't mean it. It's just a way, if I have found favor in your sight, syrupy words, I have learned by divination, and that divination is a pagan way of understanding. It's as if you went to the carnival down the street and, and got a palm reading and said, can you tell me my future by the lines on my hands? Is there some spirit, is there some God or altar that I can go before and that they will tell me what's going to happen to me if I got a prosperous future? A fortune cookie has never worked out for me well. And I'm sure it hasn't with you either. And people who try to scratch off the cards are trying to do something other than allowing the Lord. But he knew that by he knew that the Lord had blessed me. And Laban saying this, I know all that I have. For 14 years, you've been tending my cattle. For 14 years, you've been tending my stock, my livestock. And it is a it is increased in abundance. I am where I am. Laban actually admit this. I am where I am today because God, the Lord God, has blessed you. And it seems that whatever you touch seems to turn to gold. Laban knew, Jacob, you're the goose that laid the golden egg. I just can't let you go. If you go, it's like watching money. It's like watching all the wealth that I have fly away. And so Laban's dilemma, he knew that he had a dilemma. And he's trying to charm Jacob through this. Through his divination and his pagan practice, Laban begins to try to convince Joseph, please stay. But Jacob is determined. He says, look, I need to leave. And to which Laban says this, name your price. Now you got to be careful here because something is happening. And Jacob knows that it is his desire and it is the will of God that he return to the place and where God would have him by his will. But there is Laban standing in the way saying, trying to seduce him, saying, what is it that I would have to do for you to make you not obey God's will? To keep you satisfied here. Now you have to understand Jacob. Jacob, being a con man himself, can see another con man. And he goes... What do I have to give you as far as wages? And Jacob says, keep your money. I don't want your money because I know what you do. I know how you work. There's going to be some way in which you're going to manipulate all of this circumstance. And that he reminds Laban how his livestock, and he reminds him again, wealth have increased with hard work and careful attention. The Lord has blessed you. Wherever I have been bringing back to the promise of this, what did God say to Abraham? Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Laban should have figured this out. Instead of trying to manipulate the circumstance, instead of trying to be a con artist and get his own way, seeing how he could build his own wealth, he should have known, wait a minute, the more I bless Jacob, the more blessed I become. The more I try to cheat Jacob, the more I lose. But he couldn't get it through his thick head. He thought he could manipulate Jacob. He thought he could get him to a point to where he would stay if he increased his wages because he knew that the Lord had blessed him. But Jacob said, I've got to take care of my own household. I have four wives now. I have a lot of kids to feed. I must take care of my own. 
I've been here long enough. My desire is to go do the will of God. Let me go do that. So it comes into this, number two, the conditions of Jacob and Laban's agreement. So Jacob makes a deal with him. He says, I'll tell you what, starting in verse 31, he says, what shall I give you? Jacob said, don't give me anything. I do not want your money. Have you ever known somebody to give you a gift? But when they give you that gift, there's something behind it. You know, there's a price to pay here. If they give me this money or this gift, I know these people, they want something. In some way, and somehow, they're going to hold it over me. And by the way, church, don't ever do that. If somebody, if you give somebody a gift, Expect nothing in return. Sometimes it's just better to give it without your name attached. So they do not even feel beholden to you. But also, let me say this. When somebody does give you a gift in earnest and with godliness, please do not offend them by denying it. Saying no, no, because you're not in humility. I don't, nobody takes care of me. I take care of everybody else. Sometimes you just need to be humble and say, thank you. Thank you for giving this. And don't feel beholden because they were giving it to you in the spirit of the Lord. How they give and how the Lord rewards them is between them and the Lord. But this whole gift giving and money giving and everything, sometimes it needs to be done with no, and even receiving, with no strings attached. So that nobody comes to me and say, hey, wait a minute. I was the one who took care of you when you had a time of need. I was the one who did all of this for you. You owe me. Don't ever, ever do become a Laban in your heart in this way. Ever. When you give, give unto as unto the Lord. And when you receive, receive it as from God himself. Both ways works. But here Jacob knows He says, I can't be in debt to you. I want nothing. But Jacob makes an agreement. Jacob begins to realize that as he makes this deal, he says, look, let me go to your flock. And I had a hard time thinking through this because I don't understand exactly everything that happened here. And I'm sure when you met it, speckled, spotted, striped, blah, blah, blah. At a certain point, it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. It becomes confusing like you tuned out. But when you walk in, he says, I tell you what, among all your flock, I don't want your pay, but among all your flock, let me go into the flock and let me pick all the goats that are striped, speckled, or spotted, and even the sheep, if they're not pure white, and you have any black sheep, whether lambs or sheep, let me go in and take the off-colored sheep. Now, here's what that means. Jacob was actually saying, because it was rare, they were, the goats were usually black or brown, solid. And the sheep were what color? White. Okay? But once in a while, you had a black sheep. Once in a while, you had a goat that came out striped, speckled, or spotted with white spots and all of these different colors. And Jacob said, you keep the abundance. That was most of the goats and sheep. You keep the abundance of all of them. But let me go pick out the few, those few that have different markings that are not pure white as sheep or the ones that are not pure black and brown like the goats. Let me go pick the spotted, speckled, and striped ones. And that would have been about, some have calculated, less than 20% of the livestock. But Laban looks at this and goes, okay, because Jacob even said this, and I will continue, I will continue to tend your livestock. I will continue to take care of them and let me separate and have these and I will continue to take care of mine and yours, doubling the work for Jacob. Laban thinks, are you crazy? You're going you're gonna to take that kind of? Absolutely. Laban said, good. Absolutely, you can have it this way. But it was not so fast because not only see that you may see that Jacob makes a deal, But then Laban quickly goes, just, maybe you know people like this. 
He runs from Jacob once the deal is handshaked or whatever they did, and he runs back to the flock. Now get this. He runs back. He takes all the speckled and spotted and striped goats and sheep and the black sheep, and he takes them all out of the flock, and he gives them to his boys, only leaving all the solid color sheep and goats. And he gives all the the ones that have spots, speckles, and stripes, and he gives them to his boys and sends them three days away so that Jacob could not know where they were. And therefore, what is Laban thinking in his mind? I got you now because you know what? Only the solid colors will produce solid colors. You get nothing. By deceiving him, Jacob goes on. It doesn't say that Jacob threw a tipper tramp from nothing. And it wound up that Jacob worked for him for six more years. It's interesting that circumstances or persons in our lives stand in the way sometimes of wanting us to accomplish the will of God, what God has sent us to do. This world that seduces us. No, you don't understand. I need to follow God's will. I need to do what the Lord has directed me to do. The temptations that come along the way. There's somebody like a Laban standing in front of your way saying, I will not allow you. I do not want you to do God's will. I do not want you to go down this road. You are of more benefit to me. And you doing God's will does me no good. And there are circumstances and there are people in our lives that simply constantly want to thwart or try to thwart in any way by you doing the will of God. And it looks like a mountain. Lord, if you would but remove this mountain, then I could do your will. Laban is standing in front of me. There's a mountain of circumstances standing in front of me. How am I supposed to live for you and and live godly for you and do all these things when this is in my way? Oh, Lord, how I desire to do your will, but there's all this going on. It's standing in my way. I'm sure that Jacob in his mind every day of those years and even the six more years that he would go on after Laban deceived him by sending all the spotted and the speckled and the striped away and that Jacob is looking at all the solid white sheep and all the solid black and and brown goats and he's looking at this and he's beginning to scheme. And you'll see later on in chapter 31 why he shouldn't have done that. But he begins to scheme. He begins to see the circumstances. Laban has made the circumstances impossible for me to leave. I still don't have a penny to my name. And those livestock that I could have had, he has sent three days away. I don't know where they are. Now what am I supposed to do? Jacob stands back and he begins to scheme in his mind. Now, mind you, he already had a visit from the Lord, knowing that he would have spotted, striped, and speckled sheep and goats. He knew that already, but he begins to hurry along the will of God. I've got to do something here, and I've got to meet Laban on his terms. You ever done that? Someone's done this to you? Oh, yeah, okay now, it's on. I'm going to fight fire with fire. You want to do that? I'm coming right back at you, bro. You're, You're not getting away with this. I'll show you that I'm better at this than you are. And we go toward revenge or we go toward, and we get down in the sinful gutter with them. And we begin to act the same way and do the same thing. And Jacob comes to this temptation. And as Jacob comes to this temptation, He realizes that he needs to do something about it. Number three, the cause of Jacob's abundance. And so Jacob devises a plan, verses 37 through 42. Here Jacob devises a plan, shaving. He does the weirdest thing. and I, I, Who knows what's actually going on here? I have read commentaries. I have read traditions. I have read all these things. 
But he goes out and he gets a bunch of branches from, from almond trees. And it was a type of tree that was called a plain tree. Not plain as an ordinary, but a different kind of tree. And he gets all these branches from these trees. And he sits there and he whittles so that certain parts of the branches are showing white. And then he takes these branches and he goes over and he puts them in the watering trough. And now these branches are floating in the watering trough. And it used to be a tradition, we do know this, that oftentimes people would hold a color in front of like a white blanket or a black blanket or whatever in front of the animal so that when they mated, that the color they would look at, they would be impregnated with that particular color animal. Now I know you're looking at this going, that is just an old wives' tale. Now, we do a lot of the same thing, and there has been a lot of the same things through there. But Jacob begins to, and I don't know if he believed this or not. Scripture doesn't say. But nonetheless, he takes these, and he's making, as it were, spotted and striped and different kinds of showings on the branches themselves so that when they see these branches, that they would produce like kind. And so when all the female goats that were in heat would come to the watering trough, and there they were looking at these shaved little branches with the white showing. And then the male goats would come along and, and breed. And as they breed, bred, guess what? All these solid color sheep and the different goats were beginning, they're solid color. They're beginning to produce speckled, spotted, and striped. That's all they would produce. And as he would do this more and more and more, he realized, and even Laban realized, that things are not going according to his way. Now before you think, did it have anything to do with the branches? Absolutely not. It had nothing to do with the branches. It had nothing to do with Jacob's scheming and trying to get back and say, I'll show you. And I'm sure there was either Laban or some of his servants saying, oh, it seems to work. So everybody's out now whittling sticks and showing that it had nothing to do with that. Even in spite of Jacob's sinful reaction, God is still going to fulfill his promise. And there the sheep, the solid sheep and the solid goats began to produce spotted, speckled and striped. I'm sure that in Laban's mind, it began to be confusing. But this was God's divine plan. It was not a plan according to Laban. It was not even a plan according to Jacob. God said, I will give you enough. I, what did he say in Genesis 28? I will be with you. I will provide for you. I will put food before you. I will give you clothes. I will do all these things. I will be involved in every aspect of your life. Even when you think I'm not. How is God involved in this? I'm there. I'm in the midst of it. Yeah, but I failed and I sinned. God is in the midst of it. Not of your sin and making you sin, but even in our failures, in our own sinfulness, there God is working all things out for our good and His glory, regardless. So as these sheep are beginning to, uh, beginning to, how do you say it? Flourish. And it becomes more and more and more and more that Jacob even took, I don't know exactly how he did this, but he had a way of separating the strong sheep from the weak sheep, the strong goats from the weak goats. And he would not put the sticks in front of the weak ones, and he would give them to Laban because they would not produce. And all the strong ones, he would put the sticks in the watering trough for them, and then they would produce of like kind, and he put them aside for him. So that Jacob's flock grows and grows and grows, and get this, Laban's begins to shrink and shrink and shrink. It was not because of Jacob's miraculous scientific understanding of wood and animals and mating practices. Although I have to say this, Jacob would have known the livestock after taking care of them for 14 years. He was an expert on how to do these things. But it was God that was blessing. And so you even get to the end of chapter four, chapter 31 and get this. Um, 
excuse me, chapter 30, at the end of chapter 30, it says, thus the man, Jacob, increased greatly and had large flocks. He had all kinds of male, female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys in that six years. Now you remember, when he got to that 14-year part, he was penniless still. But then Laban, he makes an agreement, with Laban, just let me have these few sheep that are spotted, speckled, and scrambled. Let me just go. But Laban works it out, and Laban should have, if he was smart, he should have known God would bless him if he blessed Jacob. Because the normal practice, let me give you these, let me give you some wine, let me give you some clothes, let me give you some wood, let me give you some things according to Mosaic law that will help you on your way. Laban would have been blessed, but it ends up that at the end of the six years, 20 years, and that's six years, Jacob accumulated such wealth that it almost left Laban in much more poverty than Jacob was. The roles began to switch. Let me tell you something. Anytime anybody tries to hinder the very will of God, all of creation will fail. God will always succeed. So it gets to this point where we begin to understand some application, and that application actually, things begin to be explained in chapter 31. How did it work out this way? Why did it work out this way? Read with me in chapter 31, just a couple of verses down. Now Jacob heard the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's from what was our father's. He has gained all this wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, it's time to get up, return to the land of your fathers and your kindred, and I will be with you. So it comes down to the point where they realize the boys, listen, jealousy comes in wealth so often. Somebody has a lot of money. I always think of the people that win the lottery. You have cousins you never even knew you had. All of a sudden, they come out from the world. Can I borrow? Can I borrow? Can I borrow? Can I have? Can I have? Can I have? And when you say no, 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 then jealousy begins to take in. Anger begins to set in. And this is exactly what's happening. Laban's boys are looking at Jacob's wealth. He's got servants to boot. He's got camels. He's got donkeys. Remember, this is the sign of wealth in that part of time. Now we look, how much do I have in the bank account? How big is my house? How kind of cars do I have? None of that. It all came in the form of donkeys and camels and sheep and goats and livestock and all of these things. And Jacob had it all now. And the boys are looking saying, he took from our father, which he did not. He did, and you'll see down in this chapter, he did not steal from his father, but he said, he took from our father. He stole all these things from our father. And then Laban saying, yeah, you know what? You're right. Now Jacob's life is in trouble and the life of his family. Laban did not love his daughters. He treated them like foreigners. Laban did not love his grandchildren. Laban loved one thing and one thing only, himself. That's all he was out for. And now Jacob is looking at Laban and goes, he's not regarding me with favor like he used to. I think it's time to get out of here. And the Lord came and said, yep, you need to leave now. Read on. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah and to the field where his flock was and said to them, I see your father does not regard me with favor as he once did, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength. He didn't serve him half-heartedly. He served him with everything that he had. Yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock would produce spotted. And if he said, the striped shall be all your wages, then all the flock would produce striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats and the ma that mated with the flock were striped and spotted and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, I said, here, am I, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. So he comes and Jacob says, Leah, Rachel, look, understand me. 
Your father kept trying to cheat me and he changed the wages 10 different times over six years. One or, once or twice every year, he would change the whole contract. And when he said, every, every goat and sheep that is spotted will be yours. And guess what? All the sheep and goats that were born were all spotted. And then Laban would come again and say, that's off. No, we're not doing that anymore. All the ones that are striped are yours. And guess what? All the sheep and the goats who were born were what? Striped. Laban couldn't win. He was going against God. He was going against the man of God. God was working through Jacob. There was no way for him to win this war. And Jacob's flock grew and grew and grew. And the sons became angry. And as Laban tried to cheat and cheat and cheat. But God came to him in a dream and already told Jacob. He didn't tell him to lay down sticks. He didn't tell him to shave them. He didn't tell him to do anything else. He said, they will be yours. But in Jacob's scheming, trying to get back at Laban, sinfully tried to take matters in his own hands, but God worked in spite and despite Jacob. And that's a wonderful thing, is it not? Even when I have really crossed the line on so many different levels, God is still at work. But we must not lose the theme here. What is that? He said in verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you were anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go from this land and return to the land of your kindred. So God reminds him, do you remember Jacob? In chapter 28, do you remember? You said that I would be your God and I listened to you. I recognized your vow. Though as human and flawed as it could be, nonetheless, God recognized the vow. I have provided for you. I have done everything that you have asked, Jacob. Now get up and go back to the land of promise. Go back to the land of promise. Because this was the goal the whole time. And nobody, not even Laban, was going to keep God from his will and making sure that Jacob went back to the land of promise with the promised children in whom the Messiah would come from. Satan tried to stop it. The world, like Laban, tried to stop it. Even Jacob's flesh got involved by manipulating the circumstances all through the way, thinking that his way would get the job done, all the while God saying, Jacob, you don't need to do that. My will has been established. It will happen. Regardless of you, I will bring you in to that promised land. So there are some principles here at the end that we want to pay attention to. Number one, God prospers and blesses according to his divine plan. I understand this, not the merits of his people. If I'm good enough, if I'm good enough, if I've been his good child today, Certainly he will bless me more. And there are practical things in holy living and righteous living, yes, that the New Testament absolutely calls us to, to live godly, to live holy. But at any point, we based, we think that God has blessed us based on our merit, that God has blessed us even with the heavens and all the heavens of creation blessed me in Christ because of my merit. And so understand this, when you look at Jacob, Do you think it's because of what a great guy Jacob is and that's why God is blessing Jacob? Do you think it was because Isaac was such a a holy man that he blessed him in the world? What about Abraham and all of his sin and all of the things that he, he did not listen to God? God blesses, understand this, and take it deep to heart. God blesses, And prospers, and I don't mean just financially, but in godliness and walking with him, he does it according to his divine plan and nothing will stop God's divine plan being worked out in you. He will make you into the image of his son. Remember, that's your final goal. Remember, that's God's goal for your life. 
that you would be the image of his dear son. Why? For his glory. Number two, it also says, God will always secure and protect the people of his plan. That's you and me. That's Jacob. That's Abraham. All those that are in Christ and in God. God will always secure and protect the people of his plan, regardless of the scheming of the world, the flesh, and the devil. How often we worry and worry, oh, China, they're probably going to take that with World War III. Yeah, so what? Does that change God's plan in any way? We didn't get the president that we wanted to in the White House. Oh, man, and they're just, all kinds of evil are coming out and, and we're beginning to see Pandora's box and it's darker than it's ever been before. That's exactly according to God's plan. You will be secure. Nothing is going to happen to you. Do not take thought of what you will eat or wear. Do not take thought in such a life. Work hard with your hands. Do what you can. But understand that in the end, it is God's plan. It is His divine plan. And let me tell you, look at yourself and saying, nothing will take me away from His blessing. Nothing will take me away from keeping me from His promised land. We also see that God will deliver His people from the land of exile into His promised land. Was Jacob in exile? Oh yes, he was. He was out of the promised land. But yet God, in all those years, in all page 20 years, God was doing something in the midst while he was in exile. God was showing himself faithful in everything. God had produced the very tri fathers of the tribes of Israel there. God was making his plan to produce the Christ through the line of Judah. God was producing his plan of Joseph in his whole life as he became second in command of Egypt. And all of a sudden, Abraham, all of a sudden you begin to see Jacob and all the sons of Israel wind up in Egypt and there they would go into in exile in Egypt and they became numerous and the Egyptians put the children of Israel under slavery but God after hundreds of years comes to Moses at a burning bush and says take them out and God, by his divine plan, not even the king of Egypt was going to divert the plan of God in any way, shape, or form. He had a mighty army. Israel did not. He had mighty wealth. Israel did not. He had mighty everything. And Israel did not. He took a weak, feeble, enslaved people and set them free and brought them to his promised land. God fulfilled his promise even so much that we see that God tells Moses to go tell the people, hey, by the way, go to your neighbor, the Egyptians, and tell them, yeah, we need your gold rings and your silver. And the people of Egypt considered themselves in such, considered the children of Israel in such good reputation, plus they didn't want any trouble, and it was the, it was the, it was the most peaceful plundering you could ever imagine. Yeah, take my gold rings, take my earrings, take my silver. And they walk out, going to the promised land, not penniless or empty, but with the great wealth that God had given them by a conquered people called the Egyptians. Israel didn't lift a finger. God did it all. And he brought them into the promised land. Jacob didn't have to lift a finger. God did it all. And when you see Abraham going into Egypt, not obedient to God, and there in Egypt, God begins to smite the house of the Pharaoh. And what does he say to Abraham? Look, I didn't know she was your sister, she was your wife. I thought she was your sister. You lied to me. And in spite of all this, he said, take the camels, take the goats, take the earrings, take everything. And they come back into, Abraham comes back with many servants and many camels and many goats and great wealth. And there were so many times in the book of Genesis, people are saying, hey, Abraham, here, have it all. Because I know if I bless you, God will bless me. How God works without us lifting a finger without a worry or a doubt. And yet so often we get our eyes off the target that God is good. Listen, the most important thing in your life is this. It's not taxes. 
That's just annoying more than anything. But it's not taxes. It's not your car, break it down. It's not your, when your kids won't behave. It's not your marriage, although that's important. But it's not the be all and end all. He said, what God is doing in your life to show Christ. Some here, you may not even know it, but you're coming to the end of your life. You love the Lord. You're in Him. He has been faithful to you in all that He has promised. And you have suffered. We all suffer in this flesh, do we not? In various ways, we suffer with sickness. We suffer with the difficulties of this life. We suffer with the darkness of this life. And there comes a point where we feel like exiles, as Peter says. I feel that in 1 Peter chapter 1, he's just, we're just living in exile. This is not our home. And every day, just like Jacob in Padan Aram with Jacob, we realize every day, I just want to be where I'm supposed to be. And that is in the presence of Christ. This is not my home. I don't want to set up my tents and, and start living a life as if this is all I get and this is all there is. Oh no, God has much, much more for me. He's already set his plan. I know I'm the man in exile. I'm the woman in exile. I'm the believer. We are the church in exile, as it were. We know that we are aliens and strangers. Just like Abraham in Egypt, just like Jacob in Padanaram, always want let's just get back to the promised land where God will bless us. And Jesus even said that about us. And Jesus, through much, much suffering, he came into exile from heaven to come here to a sinful, dark place to live among us. And through the suffering of his life and through the suffering of the cross, he brought many sons to glory. If he hadn't come, we would not be. We would be cursed. But because the Son of God left his throne to come and to live for us and to die for us in all the suffering, look what it produced. And what will your suffering produce? No eye has seen nor ear heard what is in store for those that belong to him. That is why I said, Jesus said this. Remember when he said in John 14 to the disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, and get this, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And Jesus is saying, all of this, understand this, nothing, there is nothing, whether your own sin, whether the devil or all the world in its darkness and seduction. Nothing will keep you from Christ coming to gather you for Himself to live in that eternal promised land where there is no clouds and there is no night and there is no sickness and there is no death. All the wealth and all the things that happened to Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac, all of that was a picture of something far more glorious that we have greater revelation now. We will not be in Padan, Aram forever. We will not be in this Egypt forever. There is one who is coming and he will bring us into his glory for the glory of God and all of his grace and mercy that he has demonstrated by the love of Christ and him crucified, resurrected, sitting at the right hand of God, coming for you and for me. That is why Jesus said in John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me. This is the, Jesus speaking to the Father, saying what his great desire for you, his disciples, and all of the church through all ages, even the Old Testament church, 
I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me from the foundations of the world. The Father perfectly loved the Son. And because the Son and the Father loved us, we will be with the Son in glory. And this is the great desire of Christ. It's, it is how my life ends. Here's the fact. It really never does. It just goes on for eternity in all glory with Jesus Christ. And if the Son is praying this, and the Father is listening to this, who loved the Son from the foundation of the world, there's nothing standing in the way. And anybody that tries to stop it is trying to stop a huge tidal wave with a straw. There's no stopping it. Those who are blessed by the Father with salvation in Christ, you will inherit the kingdom. It is the ultimate land of the promise. That is your inheritance. This is, an, this is not it. In fact, everything that we see, even right now, visually with our eyes, Peter says we'll be burned up with a great fire. But only so that a new kingdom of eternal one can be produced. A new heaven, a new earth. But Jesus even says to the sheep and the goats, he looks at the sheep, the goats are rejected, but the sheep, he says, then the king will say to those on his right, and I love this, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for you. If you are not in Christ, it's not for you. Let me say this. If you do not know and by faith have come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I will say this lovingly, but I want you to hear the truth. You will be judged and you will be damned. And it will never end. And it will be for all eternity. Come, flee to Christ. He is your only salvation. But for those in Christ, the things that are to come in that promised land. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was, and, and the children of Israel were but a picture of more glorious things to come. That God will supply, God will protect, God will bless you in the salvation of Christ by his divine plan, and he will bring you no matter what. And there will be nothing, nothing, nothing that will stop him from his divine will for your life in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, again, Father, we could just keep peeling back the word of God and find more and more and more and more hours and hours and days could be spent on this one chapter. Father, your word is eternal. And in your word we go and we see the promises that are there. We saw how faithful you were to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Padanaram. Laban, who was a lying, scheming man. Jo and Jacob, who manipulated and did all of these same things. You did not base your blessing and your divine plan based on his merit. Because you loved him and chose him before the foundations of the world. And Father, may we be reminded it is the same thing with us. You do not love us based on our merit. You love us because of Jesus Christ. You love us because you sent your only begotten Son. We may be saved by him and him alone. Our sins washed away and the mercy of forgiveness, and the grace by which you justified us and accounted us as righteous, accounted to us the very life that Jesus lived perfectly obedient to the Father, to you, Father, by, and you have now accounted us as if we had done the same. This is unspeakable grace and mercy. We don't understand, but we do know one thing. 
what you have promised and what you have willed for the church, the true church that is in Christ Jesus, will not fail. You will bring many sons into glory for all of eternity. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.